Now, before we get started, um, I, I want to give an example of what this is all about and the quantum leap theory that I've developed. There's a lot of guys that have made a lot of money in the country, and there's a lot of guys that have written books or tried to write books to, to illustrate their methodology. But there are very few, if any, that have really, in a measured way, put that methodology down and are touring the country and explaining what they've done, how they've done it, and giving and, and at the same time give you a model to follow. Now, the gen there's a gentleman here today named um, Casey Stevenson, which I think he stepped out to go to the men's room. And I want to show you exactly. A week ago, he attended the seminar on May 22nd in Los Angeles. He's in the jewelry business. He's been successful in his own right. But he wanted to make that next leap, that quantum leap, which we're going to talk a lot about. I received the facts. When I was sitting down for dinner from him, this fax, uh, I guess it's a week ago, it's not even a week ago, five days ago, I need to talk to you as soon as possible. It's very important. Thank you, Casey Stevenson. He's in the jewelry business. I received this next fax. This is at my home at Guthrie Castle in Scotland. I need to talk to you as soon as possible. It's very important. Thank you. I call Casey as I'm getting ready to go out to dinner, and... Um, uh, as confident as he is, there was a little, um, shall we say, panic in his voice. And he said, my effing deal is collapsing. And I said, are you using the manual? Are you following uh, the credos? He says, yeah, but my effing deal is effing collapsing. So we talked a little bit. I gave him a little encouragement. I go to dinner, and I, and I said, I'll think about it. I think I might have another idea when I get back. When I got back from dinner, this fact. There is no need for you to give me a call back. The deal went through, and I'm signing the papers right now. I'll talk to you about it this weekend. Thank you. <laughs> now, there's Casey. We've been using you as an example here. Um, now, Casey is intense. Casey is motivated. And um, uh, he went to and uh, our seminar in January, or excuse me, in uh, May 22nd. My primary goal in getting in this business, the personal development business, is to try, not try, to change the personal development business so there's really permanent, long-lasting change. A lot of you have been to all the gurus, read their books, listened to their tapes, and you're still having to go listen to their tapes and read their books. Um, and what I want and what I will accomplish in the next few years is once you've gone through this process and once you've replicated and continue to reinforce it, you won't have to continue to buy the book, listen to the tape, and put your, your derrieres on seminar seats. So well, that's what I really want is to evoke permanent change in the industry as a whole not just the people that attend. Okay, Auntie. Now, those who couldn't join us today had a lot of reasons. I don't need a coach. I don't need a seminar. I don't need to listen to tapes. I don't need to read a book, and I can do it. And then I asked them, why in the hell haven't you? It's estimated that 95% of the people in the world today do not fulfill even 10% of their potential. 10%. Not 90%, 10%. We always have a reason or an excuse from when we buy a car, if we're going to get married, if we're going to get divorced, whether we should expand and grow our business or why we're not, our life, buying a new house, giving bad news. One of my pet peeves is when people call me, is this a good time to talk to you? It's always a good time. And it's always a good time to give bad news. Just as it's always a good time to give good news. Taking on new responsibilities. One thing that we all as human beings frown upon or have some uh, repugnant feeling is when we've got to change. Nobody likes change. Uh, we like the status quo. 
There, ever, there never is a right time to do something that will expand or grow you as an individual or your business because all the time, every minute of the day, and as you'll see, some of the things that I, that I profess and some of the things that I've done, and some of you know how I got started, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, with nothing, and I built a company that was worth over $400 million. Um, it's because it was always the right time, because I ate it, I breathed it, I slept it, much to the chagrin of my wife on many occasions. Um, I consumed it. I had passion. I will speak with great passion today. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about is three of the top motivational gurus in the country uh, are now, um, we'll use the word mimicking, um, uh, my methodology. Quantum Leap, you'll see in their advertisement now, Quantum Leap, uh, Laser Beam Focus, You Can Do It. Um, and I don't think that's a coincidence that all that's happened just in the last um, uh, few months. Now, this is a list, we're going to go through it very quickly, of all the reasons why you're not more successful. Now, just kind of put a little check mark, one check mark down for everyone that applies to you as an individual. If I didn't have a spouse and or a family, if I had enough pull, if I had money, if I had a better education, if I had good health, if I only had time, if times were better, if other people understood me, if conditions around me were only different, if I could live my life over again, boy, that's a great one, if I didn't fear what they would say, if I had been given a chance, if I, had now, if I now had a chance, if other people didn't have it in for me, if nothing happens to stop me, if I were only younger, God knows, if, 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 if I could only do what I want, if I had been born rich, if I could meet the right people, you're meeting the right person right today. So, okay. Um, if I had the talent that some people have, if I dared to assert myself, if I only had embr embraced past opportunities, if people didn't get on my nerves, if I didn't have to keep house and look after the children, if I could save some money, if the boss only appreciated me, if I only had somebody to help me, you do now. If my family understood me, if I lived in a big city, if I could just get started, if I were only free, if I had the personality of some people, if I weren't so fat, if my talents were known, if I could just get a break, if I could only get out of debt, if I hadn't failed, if I only knew how, you're going to know how now. If everybody didn't oppose me, if I didn't have so many worries, if I could marry the right person, God. I, I, I get emotional over that one. If, if people weren't so dumb, if my family wasn't so extravagant, if I were sure of myself, if luck weren't not against me, if I had not been born under the wrong stars, if I were not true that, if it were not true, what is to be will be, if I hadn't lost my money, if I lived in a different neighborhood, if I didn't have a past, if I, if I only had a business of my own, if other people would only listen to me. If, and this is the greatest of them all, if I had the courage to see myself as I really am, I would find out, find out what is wrong with me and correct it. Then I might have a chance to profit by my mistakes and learn something from the experience of others. For I know that there is something wrong with me or I would now be where I would have been if I had spent more time analyzing weaknesses and less time building alibis to cover them. All of the above are fatal to success. How many in the audience check at least one of those alibis? Now I'm not going to ask you if anybody checked all of them. But I have had people that checked a majority of them. Now. Most people take the path of least resistance. That's why rivers and most people are crooked. Now, I, I borrowed those words from Napoleon Hill, who I have a great deal of admiration for, and I wish that I could have met him. Um, we're not going to talk about the path of least resistance because the path of least resistance isn't the path to super success. Now, why do you think 
the personal development business is at an all-time high, a peak now. It's a five, six, seven billion dollar business now. And in the 1950s and 60s, it was a uh, hundred million dollar business. Why do you think? And times are unsure. For the first time, companies like IBM are laying people off. For the first time in, uh, in, in memory, in history, Japan is laying off people in their companies. When you, when you got a job in Tokyo, it was for life. For uh, the first time, we're having uh, uh, people have to worry about making a living in, in the Iron Curtain countries. Uh, times are tough. So what we're going to do today is we're going to get real focused. To overcome these kinds of circumstances, you have to get focused. You have to get what I call laser beam focused. Now, how many of you saw the British Open on television a few weeks ago? Greg Norman won from Australia. Does anybody remember the interview that the very dry Brit, British fellow uh, conducted with him and what he said, why the difference from all the times he almost got there and now he made it and he won? Well, what he said was, I got focused this time. I got in the zone and I stayed in the zone and I didn't allow myself to deviate. We're going to talk about getting in the zone and what I call getting in the alpha state. What we're, what we're going to talk about is doing things against conventional wisdom, doing things against what, and we have a, 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 at least one father-son team here, against what your father had taught you for 40 years. I mean that two and two make four. Two and two don't make four. And you're going to see that. So we're going to get laser beam focused. We're going to develop your laser beam focus. Because, this is very important, how many family people do we have? Virtually everybody. Almost everybody. You let yourself, family, business down when you lose focus. Now just think about that. From, if you don't learn anything else from today, every time you lose focus in the future, every time you stop thinking about what you started, just think about all the people and all the entities you're letting down. You let yourself, family, that's your sons, daughters, etc., grandchildren, and business down. It's very important. I venture to say that if you thought about that in the last five or ten years, every time you lost focus, it would be easier for you to get refocused. Okay, we have, take, we have a handout. Now put these face down. I'm going to give you five seconds to look at these afterwards. And don't pick it up, Chalk. Okay. Flip over the handout. Read it quickly. Turn it over. Okay. John Allen, what did it say? Perish to the screen, the bird in the hand. Jim, what did it say? Perish to the screen, the bird in the hand. John, would you read that for me, please? Perish to the screen, the bird in the hand. No. <laughs> Chalk, Paris in the, the spring. Pa bird in the, the hand. Now everybody flip that one over and look at it. <laughs> now, leave it on. We're not expected, to, you know, this isn't a, a semantics game that we're, 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 we're trying to do right now. But when we look at situations, we don't always see what they really are. In fact, I'm going to teach you or coach you today believing that almost never is what you see what you think you see. What we're going to attempt and be very successful at today is getting you to step outside the confines of the norm. For those of you that are engineers, it will be the hardest. For those of you that are lawyers, it will be the second hardest. 
For those of you that are accountants, it will be almost impossible. <laughs> but we're still going to get it done. For those of you that are ex-evangelists, it will be easy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey. Okay. 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 What is growth? Casey? Big question. In what, uh, in what arena? In the re arena of uh, jewelry. Uh, for me personally, uh, it's going from a uh, uh, million and a half dollars a year in, in total revenues to potentially three million this year. Okay. So what Casey just described in, in, in a personal way, it's the process of growing. It's the process of developing. How many of you think that you as an individual, forget business, grew as a person, and I don't mean in the metaphysical, physical or religious sense, in the last 24 months? Okay. How many of you think that are in business that you've grown in the last 24 months. I'm here to tell you you didn't. I'm here to tell you that was Pavlov's reaction. Because my definition of growth and the reason that you're here and your definition of growth are like at two different ends of the continuum. And when we get the goal setting, I'm going to tell everybody just to add three zeros to the end, if it's a financial goal, just add three zeros, or three knots, as they say in, in the UK. Some of you, I will suggest, multiply times 10. Some of you, bless you. Some of you, I will suggest, multiply times 100. And some of you, I will suggest, multiply times 1,000. Now, I asked this question before, and for the, I, I don't want the psychiatrist to answer it, is for, the, for this example, we're just going to assume everybody's got 100 IQ. Now, for some of you, I'm, gonna I'm giving you a little with 100. <laughs> and for some of you, I'm taking away a little. And for this exercise, we'll just assume I've got 100. I'm probably giving myself a little bit. Okay. Now, Marsha, can anybody be 10, t if we're all 100 IQ, can anybody be 10 times smarter or have 1,000 IQ? She's right. Okay. Master Stewart. I don't know if my voice is loud Okay. <laughs> so would you agree that nobody can be 10, to, if we all have 100 IQ, nobody can be 10 times smarter than we are? Yeah, I agree. Okay. Well, then why are there people that make 1,000 times more than you? Are they 1,000 times smarter? Are they 10 times smarter? Are they twice as smart? There are people in this country, myself included, that have made a thousand times more than anybody in this room. Why is that? You're goddamn right. Boy, from your lips to the Lord's ears and back to them. Now, there are several ways a business can grow. There are several. Arithmetically, one plus one equals two. Geometrically, exponentially, and what I call quantumly. Now, I'm not going to get into definitions because there are differences between geometric, exponential, and quantum. There are differences. But exponential growth is increasingly rapid growth. Geometric is progression with a constant ratio between successive quantities as 1, 3, 9, 27, 88, 81. And these are some examples. Most of your businesses grow by 5 plus 5. What we're going to talk about and what we're going to put together by the end of this evening is a plan, a work plan, so you can grow at least by 5 times 5 or 5 plus 5 squared, or 5 squared plus 5 squared. But our real aim, 
for today and for the rest of your life is to grow by 5 squared times 5 squared. Now those are all the same numbers. And the way we're taught in the B schools, and by the way, I didn't go to a fancy school, and I'll talk about where I went to school in a few minutes. Uh, I went to a school you have to explain. I mean, it, uh, it's got 22 campuses, and it's got this and that, and I was on the... I mean, we'll get to that later. I didn't go to, like, Harvard or any of that. And by the way, God didn't talk, hasn't talked to me. A lot of the guys that could do this, God talked to them. Now, I know at least one person in this room I think God talked to. Uh, probably not recently, but uh, a long time ago. But God didn't talk to me. He didn't come down and t touch me and say, Dan, I want you to go and do this. He didn't do that. Some of the guys that you, you, you pay a lot, and, and gals, that you pay a lot of money to, they don't tell you about how God told them to come and help humanity. So I, I, I don't want to make that, I want to make that differentiation very clear. But that's the kind of growth that we're going to talk about. Quantum leap is sudden, high, significant, advance. It's a breakthrough. What we're going to do today is we're going to teach you to think how to break through, not at 5 plus 5, but 5 squared plus 5 squared. And there's a book, there's two books that I highly recommend people read. One is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, who I'm a big admirer of. And the second book is called You Squared by a gentleman named Dr. Pritchett. He's in Dallas. And he wrote this book three or four years ago. And I just found out about it about a month ago. And I would highly recommend it because it's about quantum thinking. Thinking that is breakthrough thinking. I mean... Some of the things we're going to talk about are the exact antithesis of how you built your business and your life. The dead opposite. The absolute opposite. Being at the absolute other end of the continuum. No, I haven't. I'm still working on it. Now, physicists studying quantum mechanics note that particles make these jumps without apparent effort. And this is going to be hard to understand. I was able to grow Great Western from $820 to $400 million with no apparent great uh, increase in effort. We're talking about marginal shifts in effort for quantum results. I, 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 I don't like using this example but because a lot of the other uh, purported gurus use it. But I'm going to, until I think of a better one, I'm going to continue to use it. The difference between being in the National ba uh, Baseball Association, batting 250 and 350, if you bat 350, you get paid three, four million dollars a year. If you bat 250, you get paid three or four hundred thousand dollars a year. That, that might be, be wrong, but that's roughly it. Now, if those, that 250 batter and that 350 batter, the difference is one hit per ten times at bat. That's a 10% increase for the difference between making 300,000 and making three or four million. Just 10%. That is a marginal shift in effort for a quantum difference. That's what we're talking about. From 1986 to 1990, I was one of the highest paid executives in the United States, five years running. Five. I didn't work 100 times harder than anybody else. We're talking about marginal shift in effort. Now certain industries I know more about because I was part of them. Brokerage industry, I was part of it. I know, and my examples will run about along the lines of industries that I've been a part of. Every example I give you today, every page in that manual, I personally did. There isn't one goddamn word of theory there. I personally did it. I didn't borrow an idea. I didn't borrow a, a theory or a notion. So when I talk, I'm talk, telling you what the Lord knows because I did it, not somebody else. And that's a big difference between what you're going to hear today from me and then what you've heard before and what you've read before. It's important to remember, quantum leaps require you to take the offensive. You cannot achieve exponential gains in your success from a defensive posture. Most of you in this room if not now, have at one time run your business from a defensive posture. I'm not even going to ask the question because a lot of you will just lie and tell me you didn't. 
You can't remain in a passive stance and make a quantum jump. A quantum leap is a move you're already prepared to make, you just haven't done it yet. Everything that I'm going to tell you today, you're already ready to do. I'll use the phrase, and, and it's, it's not meant to be a, a chauvinistic phrase, and by the way, uh, I'm very graphic in my examples, and I talk about religion, and I poo-poo a lot of things, and I'm not here to offend anybody. I'll apologize up front. Uh, but what I'm going to ask you to do is suck up your pantyhose. I mean, if you want to be big time successful, ladies and gentlemen, you got to suck up your pantyhose. There's no other way. There's not an easy way. And I, my examples, I know that people want to balance life in the 90s. Children, church, family. That's great. I do that now. But when I was building the company, I didn't do that. I don't know how to do it that way. Quite frankly, I don't know anybody that knows how to do it that way. They write all their books after they made their tons of money. And then they spend time with their family. I don't know. I just don't. And so, if it sounds like I'm dogmatic about it, I am. But I only know how I did it, and quite frankly, the other very successful people that I know, they did it the same way. So I don't mean to offend people that, that it doesn't sound like a 90s kind of comment. So I'm apologizing up front. Um, and, um, but I think that, that I don't think I know by the end of the evening, you'll have an appreciation for being super successful isn't for everybody. Talks cheap, takes money to buy whiskey in West Texas, or at least you used to, John Allen. Okay. Now, because what I'm going to get out of you, drag out of you, pull out of you, kick out of you if I have to, is so you can be all you can be. Does anybody recognize that saying? It's the Army commercial. Does anybody recognize the name Joe Batten? He's the one that wrote it. Now, Joe Batten, for those of you that don't know, is the mentor of a guy that's been pretty successful. His name's Ross Perot. Joe and I were on the dais together a few weeks ago, uh, talking for the Center for Entrepreneurial Management at one of their CEO clubs in Los Angeles. He was the main speaker and I was a, a guest Kind of, really I was being interviewed uh, uh, and wanted to, I guess, to see if I could talk, which they found out. <laughs> um, and uh, Joe is 70 years old, and uh, the book, uh, Tough Minded Management, was the Bible for Ross Perot. He made all his 45,000 employees carry one every day, and Joe wrote it. And he's been a management consultant since the 50s. And he's a very dynamic man, and, uh, and he goes around the country, the world for that matter, and talks about being all you can be. And uh, he, uh, the Army borrowed that. I, I don't know if they pay him for it. Really, I forgot to ask him. I hope they pay him for it. Be a great residual, great royalty. But um, uh, Joe um, now uh, uh, says, and as does Ross Perot, and for those of you, um, everybody in Texas has got to know who Ross Perot is. But I mean, uh, Ross Perot did it the old-fashioned way. What I call the Vince Lombardi way. I mean, and God knows Ross isn't considered a 90s guy, I don't think, by anybody in the whole wide world. I mean, I just don't think so. So I'm at Ross's end of the continuum. I mean, but if you want to be all you can be, and you don't want to let down your family, your business, etc., what you're going to learn here today will, 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 you will benefit and it will be of incalculable value to you. Okay. Because contrary to what you've been taught, you are paid in life for not for what you know, ladies and gentlemen, but what you can do and what you can get others to do. You're not paid for what you know. If I was paid for what I know, it's shuddering to think where I'd be today. But because I've been able to do and get people
people to do, because what we're going to talk about, is your maximum leverage in life is other people. You can't do a big things without other people's assistance and motivating other people to do your bidding, your wish. Ideas are a dime a dozen. The person who puts them into action is priceless. And we all want to be, in my judgment, that person, the priceless person. Okay. Now, I've often said, when people ask me if I was ready, I always tell people I was born ready, but that's not true. Um, it's not being ready to be successful. It's being comfortable with success. And we're going to talk a lot about the trappings of success. And they're heavy. Whoever said it's lonely at the top is a smart guy or a smart gal. And we're going to talk about it's even harder to stay at the top, which I have some personal experience that I can relate to that I can't do too much detail because I go to court on the 16th in Houston, Texas here. But I mean, it's tough. It's tough. And although I, would, I will coach you to... You should surround yourself with as smart people as you can find. Because being a CEO or being an entrepreneur is like riding a bucking bronco. And everybody's trying to knock you off. And the trick is to stay on there. But I prepared myself over a series of years to be successful and to be successful and to be comfortable with the trappings. Now, I'm going to real quickly run through some of the main points that we are going to cover today. Um, I've already briefly touched upon the many faces of conventional wisdom. There's a few opportunities to change your life, to lead to the next level. We're going to redefine your formula for success in a geometric sense. Half of it, in my judgment, is recognizing the proverbial knock. This may be yours. We're going to establish quantum leap goals. Not any kind of goal that you've ever thought of before, I assure you. We're going to talk about confrontation with the doomsayers. The name of the seminar used to be called You Can't Do That. Because there's 86 times in this book manual that people have told me I can't do it. And all 86 I've done it. In fact, there's about 93 or 4 now, but the book's not up to date since I started this business. But um, almost by definition, when they tell you you can't do it, you ought to do it. I just recently saw the movie Alexander Graham Bell, The Life Story, uh, with uh, Don Amici and Henry Ford. Henry Ford looks like his bar mitzvah picture. He looks about 19 years old in the movie. And uh, the famous scene uh, when he spills the acid on his leg and he talks through the, the wire and, and, and the telephone was invented. But that was his 10,000th experiment. He was wrong 9,999 times. Now, I have to admit, I'm not sure that I could last 10,000 times. And I'm a pretty persevering guy. I mean, I don't know the word, no, you can't do it, give up. But, I mean, I think Alexander Graham Mill was a psycho myself. But, <laughs> I mean, I mean, 10,000. Everybody said he couldn't do it. And then even after he invented the damn phone, he had a a group of uh, all the people of uh, wherever city it was in at that time, all the industrialists and the money people and the bankers and other inventors, and then they thought it was a joke. They thought it was a, it, it was a, it was a, like a, a, a lounge act from the Reno Casino or something. They thought it was a big joke, and they just said it, it'll fail, nobody will ever do it. And then ultimately one or two guys put up money, and then as soon as the deal worked, of course, the Western Union stole it. And so then he went to court and fought in court, which I can relate to this. He fought in court, and he almost lost it. All his money, all his time, all his effort went into defending this, this idea. But 10,000 times, now just think about how many times you started something and done it once, twice, five, eight. I use an example. I, the last year I uh, taught pro bono at the school I went to. I teach a workshop. And um, it's a 10-hour it's workshop. It's on Saturdays. We started with 415 students. We cut it down to 80 students. They had essay contests to be the final 15. And 
then I was going to take a group of them to the castle for the castle seminar. Uh, the essays from the, uh, and I read the essays, I didn't grade them, uh, a professor did. And when I read the essays, I thought these were the ones we rejected. But these were the cream of the crop. These were the winners. I was appalled. In my judgment, uh, with the greatest respect, college students of today aren't worth powder to blow them to hell. I mean, they have no perseverance for the most part. They've got little intellect for the most part. And, and, and it's a good thing the, 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 the iron curtain cr crumbled because that, they'd eat our lunch. I mean, we just... But anyway, so I, I teach this workshop, and the more pressure I put on the students, the more of them dropped it. The more pressure I put on, the more of them dropped it. And ultimately, we went from 415 to 1. One student, who now works for me. His name is John Macias, who Auntie, my assistant, knows, and who Leanne's uh, talked to. Now, the point of the story is, they were uh, looking for internships, I think they call it, jobs for the summer. And they sent out resumes, and they were all down in the dumps. And we have them over to my house. We have catered, and a lot of them have never been to a catered event. And my housekeeper's black, and Ruth, who thinks that these kids are worthless. She doesn't like even waiting on them. But <laughs> she says, Mr., as she calls me, they all want to work. No, they all want a paycheck, and none of them want to work. They wouldn't know bad times if it bit them in the ass. She says, working is picking tobacco. She's from North Carolina. <laughs> Cotton was easy. Tobacco is hard. <laughs> so we're talking about resumes, and I, a very good friend of mine, the youngest mayor in the United States, his name is Fidel Vargas. He's the 23 years old Harvard. He went home after his, graduate, or his undergraduate degree at Harvard, and he uh, saw that the city that he lived in was in chaos, so he ran for mayor and won, 23. He took a respite between that and his MBA, and now he's on, because he's, he's a Democrat, he's on Clinton's committees and all this. But he came over to my workshop as a role model. And he's talking to the students. We're talking about resumes. And how many did they send out? Six, eight, eleven. Not a one of them had got a job offer yet. So I bring in Mayor Vargas. I said, Fidel, how many resumes did you send out? Seven hundred. Seven hundred. How many job offers did you get? One. Did you take the job, Fidel? He says, yes. Now, when he said 700 to these students, I can assure you their faces turned as white as this paper. They couldn't believe it. The most resumes any of those students had, t had sent out was 30. 700. 10,000 times to make the phone. How many times have you, and I don't ask the question anymore because I've learned after doing this a few times, because I don't like to put people, make people that uncomfortable, because I can already see people getting uncomfortable because they're starting to figure out why they haven't been more successful. But you're going to feel real comfortable by the end. Okay, we're going to talk about the five credos and how and why they'll work for you. And these are credos for my success and for your success that I developed from 1976 to 1978, which we'll talk about. We're going to talk about managing growth, preparing for diversification, big dreams, big problems, big rewards. If your life is not, if one, and I know challenge is the, is the 90s word. I still call them problems. If your problems are not being replaced by geometrically greater problems, one after another, you're not growing. Now, in the last 48 hours, as I told somebody last night over a few drinks, I mean, the last 72 hours, I mean, I had a series of challenges. Each one was 10 times bigger than the one before, and I had 10 of them all in three days. Must mean I'm growing. And I told my wife that on the phone uh, a couple days, or yesterday, because all these plans she has with the kids and people visiting the castle, and basically she's got to come here right away. And she says, well, Dan, well, what about your dying grandmother, my dying mother and father? Uh, and she went through a list of about 25 things. I said, Linda, I know you can handle it. I know you're up to it. <laughs> and she says, who's going to take care of the kids? I mean, we just, uh, the, the nanny, we just let take 20 days off. Uh, the housekeeper we just is in Vegas, Ruth, the tobacco pickers in Vegas, which is her favorite place to go. She says, Dan, what, where? 
I said, you can handle it, Linda. I got to go now. I got to go back into the, uh, you know, I'm getting ready for trial. She says, okay, I'll be there. Click. Now, if your business is not experiencing that kind of what you'll call chaos, then you're not testing your limits. You're not pushing the edge of the envelope, as they, as they say. We're going to talk about managing for unexpected events. We're going to talk about what you can probably already figure out. Do the ends justify the means? The answer is yes. And we're going to talk about why a racehorse wears blinders. Why does a racehorse wear blinders? You're damn right. Stay focused. We're also going to talk about exit strategies. Most people's exit strategy in this room, I, 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 a lot of these questions I don't ask anymore because people have raised their hand and I know it's not true. But most extra, people's exit strategy in this room is dropping dead. That's your exit strategy and hope that there's enough insurance to cover your estate tax. By the way, you know, how many of you are partners in business with somebody? Okay. Okay. Do you know you've got another partner? IRS. They own 55% of your business. The government. Yeah. Financial planner, Brad here sitting in the front from Chicago. You've got another partner. I, I, I've, sa I've sat in audiences where people say, I don't, I don't have to deal with that kind of stuff, then I have no partners. I say, yes, you do. 55% is, you know, unless you plan and do those certain things, is, is, is going to the, uh, the federal government. Okay. Pardon? Yeah. Now, um, and you don't have to sound like me to be successful because there's a Henry Kissinger way of doing it. And there's the Norman Schwarzkopf. Now you already know which one of the two I am, but you can. Henry Kissinger is very effective. There's two different ways. So don't get the idea you have to sound like Dan and pound the table and rant and rave and scream. Because I've seen people be very successful in doing it the Henry Kissinger way. Ignorance is a steep hill with jagged rocks at the bottom. That's me. Dan Pena said that because a lot of what I'm going to say today and you're going to go out and, and, and put it into practice, people are going to say you're crazy. There's a lot of ignorance out there. A lot of ignorance. They're going to say you're crazy. And again, it's how much you want to suck up your pantyhose. This isn't a case of taking a big chance. It's a matter of giving yourself a big chance. It really is. It's a matter of giving yourself a big chance. Now, as I've already mentioned, um, most of everything I say is against what the normal conventional wisdom tells you. It's a different way of decision making. Uh, it's uh, not a great rich quick scheme. There's no elevator to the top, I assure you. It's one form of opportunity and it's not for anybody. Everybody, excuse me. Uh, but because I did it and because there are people in this room, who, uh, which I'm going to ask to talk, maybe they will, maybe they won't, that I know they've done it using that black book in just a matter of months. And I'm not one for extrapolating out how successful one's going to be. Because if Casey doesn't stay at it, I can tell you where that success will go. Down with a tidy bowl man. It just you know down with if Casey doesn't stay at it, even though it's work for him, that's where it's going to go. You have to stay after it, and or you have to get people to stay after it for you, with you. Now, for those of you that are engineers, again, uh, I mean, this perfection equals paralysis. What we're going to talk about is doing it good enough. I was a detail-oriented person until I was 31 years old. I took more notes. By the way, I, I kept more records. I, 
I was successful by normal standards. I made quite a bit of money. Then I attended a seminar, which I'll talk about a little later, and I stopped being detail-oriented, and I took on the good enough. It's good enough. Since I adopted the good enough method is when I have attained all my success, 95% um, of it anyway, and I built um, a successful, very large company. Most successful people do it poorly until they do it well. Just keep blundering. You cannot wait until the time's exactly right. We're going to talk about, it's not being ready, it's being comfortable. You're never ready. Norman Schwarzkopf was not ready to lead man at des Desert Storm. Norman Schwarzkopf was comfortable with his ability to succeed. I was not ready to be a CEO of a large company, but I was comfortable with my abilities. You are not ready, for those of you that have uh, had children, which I, I, I have sympathy for, you're never ready to be a mother. You're not ready to have that thing, I mean, that, that come out of your body. I mean, you're not ready. You're just not. You're not ready when they make a cardinal a pope. You know, I mean, it's not a matter of being ready. It's a matter of being comfortable. And there's a big difference. And for those of you that get comfortable with it, it's going to be a lot easier for you. Because success leaves clues. And the one thing I do agree with that all the speakers, or mostly all the speakers, talk about is to pattern themselves after somebody that's been successful. Most of us, through life, pattern ourselves after our father, our mother, our older brother. And unless you're blessed with a super successful father, mother, older brother, or older sister, I'm afraid that I got bad news for you. You're going to wind up just like them. John Allen Chalk, many years ago, gave me some advice. This is, being, I think, before I had children. And he has very successful children. And, uh, and, uh, and I take my hat off to him. And maybe John will share some, a few things with us a little later. He said, Dan, he says, I learned a long time ago. He says, I wonder, if I want my children to, 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 to grow up this way, I have to put them in that environment. And that's what he did. If you want to be successful in life, in business, you have to put yourself in that environment. This is that environment. I'm one of those kind of people. I will stay here tonight and answer questions to the wee hours. I talk to the participants just as I converse with Casey. He faxed me at the castle. I do that. Some of the motivational gurus that I know that I consult with and talk with, they say, Dan, that's a bad precedent to set, talking to all those people. He says, you won't have time to do that. I said, why not? He says, Dan, I mean, the thousands, I mean, and that's how they think, unfortunately. I will not have a, have a masseur or a metaphysical psychic here like some of these guys do, and I won't tell you I have a migraine, and I'm I just not with it today. Uh, I, I would be up here, unless I drop dead from a heart attack today, I will be just as motivated tonight when we end as I am now, because I owe you that. Now, this is a very interesting statistic and it's important to understand because people, because people are looking for a balanced life, especially now in the 90s. Napoleon Hill stated, oh, got to hit him. Things should be done poorly because it's normally 17 times. Seven, you have to do something 17 times before it, it replicated 17 times, statistics prove, before it becomes a part of you. Tennis, with me, more than 17 times. And uh, golf, with me, more than 17 times. But 17 times, now just think of the things that you tried to accomplish that you did less than 17. Probably most of them. Uh, question, Mike, here. 
Hey, what I want to ask kind of goes along with this frame, but it's more from that other one, and that's about being comfortable. Mm -hmm. I can understand not being ready because I can think back all the things I've done. I don't think I was ever ready. But being comfortable with quantum growth, what did you do? How did you know you were comfortable when you were starting when you were undertaking quantum growth steps? Like with the fifty million dollar deal in the UK. When did you know you were comfortable? All through my career, um, most of the time, people told me, and through my childhood, which we're going to talk about a little later, you can't do that, then you're basically worthless. And um, the, um, for a while, I think I probably even believed that. Not too long, but I think I did at a time for a time. And what I tried to do, and I think I was very successful, is that, I, and we're going to talk about the mentor mastermind series and how I don't think the mastermind theory is so good, and I think the mentor system is better. I try to, wherever I could, associate, be around, uh, even on a, in, a, in a peripheral manner, around very successful people. Uh, I wasn't much for reading. I read, two, I read 250 words a minute. I mean, it's, I'm, I didn't read, two, I, and this is a, a hard thing to say, but I've only read, until recently, three books in my whole life, and one of those books I read twice. I read The, the Life and Legend of Che Quivera, twice. This is even a more awful thing to say. I read candy once. <laughs> so that was the extent of my literary background <laughs> growing up. And, um, but I went places to see people that were successful. Um, and they didn't always want to see me, believe me. But I made it my business to be around them so I could be comfortable. Um, when I bought things ahead of the curve, I had a brand new Mercedes Benz. I well, know I had a Rolls Royce when I was 25. I mean, I still remember Linda and I driving in my Silver Cloud. This is a long time ago, and taking it to a 49 cent car wash, drinking beer in the front seat, and and and, and Linda wearing cut off jeans with pigtails. Linda looked about 12 at the time, and uh, and and and. And then I still remember them breaking the antenna off, and I still remember getting irritated with them. And uh, but I, and then Linda says, "Well, Dan, we went to a 49 car wash. Maybe we, maybe we should have taken one of those places they hand wash it." Uh, but I've always been ahead of the curve. I bought, and when we get in the goal setting, I I I, I thought about uh, owning a castle. Before, I owned one. In fact, one of the things that. I will suggest, and I'll show you, and I'll pass it out later, is that I used to read the Rob Report in the late 70s, and this is a, a, a magazine that's got only a subscription uh, uh, of about 18,000 people or something. But the average net worth of the people that subscribe to this magazine is $4.5 million. The average net worth, good prospecting tool, the average net worth of the people that read Forbes, does anybody know? 270,000. Fortune, Forbes, all those are between 170 and 260,000. 4.5 million. I happen to know um, Maury Povich and Connie Chung read this. I happen to know a lot of very successful people read this. And I have, before I had any money, I was reading it and I was, you know, looking at Rolls Royces and Rolexes and and things like this. And this issue, the reason, and you can look at it during the break, is because this is where rich people, the people that subscribe to this magazine, pick the very best from cars, restaurants, investment bankers, books to read, country clubs, vacation spots. I used to go to vacation spots that I, you know, where successful people would be way before I was successful. I remember being at La Quinta. Linda and I, let's see, I was 26. Linda was 21, 22. We went to La Quinta to stay to play golf, and I remember sitting in the bar, in the men's uh, grill, and they came to me, and the bartender said, excuse me, is there a Mr. Pena, Mr. Pena, Mr. And I said, yes, yes. They said, uh, and he's whispering, he says, there's a woman that purports to be your wife um, at the front gate, at the, uh, in the lobby. And I said, well, what do you mean purports? And she says, yes, because Linda had pigtails. She looked about 15 at the time, and, and they, weren't gonna, they, they, didn't, they were afraid of some side of scandal. I said, 
Well, she's got pigtails, she's blonde, she's got blue eyes. I think that that woman that purports to be my wife is my wife. He says, oh, so she comes in, you know, and it was a big, and, but we were staying at La Quinta. She comes in in the men's grill, and I mean, and, and everybody looks at her, and everybody still probably thought she was my daughter, but the, the point is, we were staying at La Quinta, and I was playing golf with guys that were 60 and 70 years old, that had been members there 30 years, and played with Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. I used to caddy. Uh, I caddy for Bob Hope when I was a kid. Uh, I used to caddy. Uh, the regular person I caddy for was Alice Marble. A lot of you are too young to remember Alice Marble. Was U.S. Open uh, tennis champion, and uh, I used to like caddying for her uh, because she used to tell me about Wimbledon, things like that. Unfortunately, it didn't roll over onto my tennis, <laughs> Jim. But the uh, I used to do those things, and I suggest my children do those things. Um, there's a fine line, though, with raising kids, which I'm no great expert at. But, I mean, there's a fine line because now my kids think everybody lives in a castle. Everybody's had chauffeurs. And my, my daughter thinks she's going well, to get married at the castle. And she's going to have a 100-foot train. That's the thing. You walk a 100-foot train walking up to the wall garden, and she expects a cardinal to marry her. She, when she said the Pope, I said, I'm not sure I can arrange that, the Pope. I don't know if the Pope marries anybody. But you put yourself, just as John Allen Chalk said about raising children, you put them in that environment, you put yourself in that environment. And it's always when you can't afford it. I couldn't afford La Quinta, but I, I was there, and I got used to it. One of the reasons my wife and I are still married, because we've grown together, is because Linda thought this was a great idea. I mean, and, and, and we've accepted these challenges my kids you know I can my kid could fly from London to Los Angeles by himself today my two sons 10 and 11 I mean they we don't have to go get the you know pay $25 to have the flight attendant walk them from here to there because they feel comfortable because they've been exposed to those things so what I did because we're going to talk about where I live in the graffiti you're going to see some pictures here in a few minutes I put myself in that position so I felt comfortable <laughs> 